All right, we're back for the miraculous journey of Edward Tulane. First, we'll read aloud. Um, we are on chapter 15. Um, last time we left off, chapter 14 ended pretty sad. What happened? Yeah, someone that worked on the train caught Bull and Lucy with Edward. Um, well, not Edward, Malone. Um, and the man kicked Malone off the train and away, and the train kept going with Bull and Lucy on it. And even the last line of the chapter, he wished that he could cry. Edward wished that he could cry. Could you imagine? We've come a long way from the Edward with Abilene to the Susanna with Nellie and Lawrence to then Malone with Lauren, with Bull and Lucy. Um, and remember we had, he would, he would, everybody would kind of reach out to Malone and tell them the names of the children or the family they left behind, their sadnesses, and Edward would hold on to that and he was listening to people. He's really grown so much. And Edward's now lost again. He's just, he just wants to be able to say goodbye to all these people. He couldn't say goodbye to Abilene. He didn't get to say goodbye to Lawrence and Nellie. Why didn't he get to say goodbye to Lawrence and Nellie? Yes, because their daughter Lottie threw him in the dump and took him away just without saying anything. And then Lucy found him dug in the trash after he was in the trash for like half a year. And then again now Bull and, Bull and Lucy, who he was really attached to, didn't get to say goodbye to them either. So bring us to chapter 15. It's going to get sadder from here, guys. So you want to pause it and grab tissues. Just saying. In the morning, the sun rose and the cricket song gave way to a bird song. And an old woman came walking down the dirt road and tripped right over Edward. Hmm, she said. She pushed at Edward with her fishing pole. Looks like a rabbit, she said. She put down her basket and bent and stared at Edward. Only ain't real. She stood back up. Hmm, she said. She rubbed her back. What I say is there's no use for everything and everything has its use. That's what I say. Edward didn't care what she said. The terrible ache he had felt before had gone away and had been replaced with a different feeling, one of hollowness and despair. So that aching sadness he had felt now just feels like emptiness and despair. He just almost doesn't feel like he can go on. He doesn't care anymore. He doesn't want to care anymore, which is very different from the Edward in the beginning that didn't care. Edward in the beginning didn't care why. Because he only cared about himself. He didn't have any feelings towards anybody. But he doesn't care now because he never gets to say goodbye and he keeps feeling loss and sadness. So he wants to stop caring so that he doesn't have to feel this sadness, right? Pick me up or don't pick me up, the rabbit thought. It makes no difference to me. The old lady picked him up. She bent him double and put him in her basket. So she kind of folded him up and shoved him in her basket. Her basket smelled of weeds and fish. And then she kept walking, swinging the basket and singing, Nobody knows the troubles I've seen. Edward, in spite of himself, listened. I've seen troubles too, he thought. You bet I have. Apparently, they aren't over yet. Edward was, Edward was right. His troubles were not over. The old woman found a use for him. She hung him from a pole in her vegetable garden. She nailed his ears to the wooden pole and spread his arms out as if he were flying and attached his paws to the pole by wrapping pieces of wire around them. In addition to Edward, pie tins hung from the pole. They clinked and clanked and shone in the morning sun. Ain't no doubt in my mind that you scare them off, the old lady said. Scare who off, Edward wondered. Birds, he soon discovered. Crows. They came flying at him, calling and screeching, wheeling over his head, diving at his ears. Go on, Clyde, said the woman. She clapped her hands. You got to act ferocious. Clyde? Edward felt a weariness so intense wash over him that he thought he might actually be able to sigh aloud. Would the world never tire of calling him by the wrong name? So now we had Edward with Abilene. We had lost Edward in the ocean. We had Susanna with Nellie and Lawrence. We had lost Edward in the trash. Then we had Malone with Bull and Lucy. And we had lost Edward on the side of the train tracks. And now we have Clyde with this old lady and he's hung kind of like a scarecrow in the garden. Sounds fun. The old woman clapped her hands again. Get to work. Scare them birds off, Clyde. 
And then she walked away from him out of the garden and toward her small house. So look. That is what Edward slash Clyde looks like in the metal tin to make noise. Oh, poor Edward. I feel bad for him now, now that he does care. The birds were insistent. They flew around his head. They tugged at the loose threads in his sweater. One large crow in particular would not leave the rabbit alone. He perched on the pole and screamed a dark message in Edward's left ear. Caw, 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 without ceasing. As the sun rose higher and shone meaner and brighter, Edward became somewhat dazed. He must mistook the large crow for Pellegrina. Go ahead, he thought. Turn me into a warthog if you want. I don't care. I'm done with caring. Caw, caw, said the Pellegrina crow. Finally, the sun set and the birds flew away. Edward hung by his ears and looked up at the night sky. He saw the stars for the first time in his life. He looked at them and he felt no comfort. Instead, he felt mocked. You are down there alone, the stars seemed to say to him, and we are up here in our constellations together. I've been loved, Edward told the stars. So, said the stars, what difference does that make when you're all alone now? Edward could think of no answer to that question. Eventually, the sky lightened and the stars disappeared one by one. The birds returned and the old woman came back to the garden. She brought a boy with her. So this, so what did Edward tell the stars? I've been loved. He finally knows it now that he's been loved by Abilene, Nellie, Lawrence, Bull, Lucy. And the, but the stars seemed to mock him and say, well, you're alone now. What does it matter? And Edward couldn't figure out the answer to that. What do you think? Does it matter? So a lot of us have experienced loss. Maybe some of us are lucky and haven't experienced loss. Grandparents, great-grandparents, aunts, uncles, friends, relatives. But do you think people, when they lose somebody, do you think that they wish they had never had that person because it hurts so bad? Or do you think it's better to love and lose than to never have loved at all? That's actually a saying. Better to have loved and lost, to have never loved at all. But Edward kind of doesn't see that right now. He's just so hurt and so upset. That's still kind of like a little bit of his selfishness coming through. He's like, I don't want to love anymore. I don't want to care anymore. All that happens is I get hurt. So that's still that little bit of, you know, him worrying about himself, worrying about getting hurt again, that he doesn't want to love again. He's not seeing love as being selfless and it not mattering what happens. But no, so now the woman's coming back to the garden. She brought a boy with her. And here's the boy. The young kid. Chapter 16. Bryce, said the old woman, get away from that rabbit. I ain't paying you to stand and stare. Yes, ma'am, said Bryce. He wiped his nose with the back of his hand and continued to look up at Edward. Clearly, clearly he's not following COVID-19 rules. No touching your face. And he continued to look up at Edward. The boy's eyes were brown with flecks of gold shining in them. Hey, he whispered to Edward. A crow settled on Edward's head, and the boy flapped his arms and shouted, Go on, get! And the bird spread his wings and flew away. Bryce! shouted the old woman. Ma'am, said Bryce, get away from that rabbit. Do your work. I ain't gonna say it again. Yes, um, said Bryce. He wiped his hand across his nose again. I'll be back to get you, he said to Edward. The rabbit spent the day hanging by his ears, baking in the hot sun, watching the old woman and Bryce weed and hoe the garden. Whenever the woman wasn't looking, Bryce raised his hand and waved at the bird circled over Edward's head, laughing at him. What was it like to have wings, Edward wondered. If he had wings when he was tossed overboard, he would not have sunk to the bottom of the ocean. Instead, he would have flown in the opposite direction, up into the deep, bright blue sky. And when Lolly took him to the dump, he would have flown out of the garbage and followed her and landed on her head, holding on with his sharp claws. And on the train, when the man kicked him, Edward would not have fallen to the ground. Instead, he would have risen up and sat on the train and laughed at that man. Caw, caw, caw. In the late afternoon, Bryce and the old lady left the field. Bryce winked at Edward as he walked past him. One of the crows lighted on Edward's shoulder, means landed, and tapped it with its beak at Edward's china face, reminding the rabbit with each tap that he had no wings.
that not only could he not fly, he could not move on his own at all, in any way. Dusk descended over the field, and then came true dark. A whippoorwill sang out over and over again. Whippoorwill, whippoorwill. It was the saddest sound Edward had ever heard. And then came another song, the hum of a harmonica. Bryce stepped out of the shadows. Hey, he said to Edward. He wiped his nose with the back of his hand again and then played another bit of song on the harmonica. Bet you didn't think I'd come back, but here I am. I come to save you. Too late, thought Edward, as Bryce climbed to the pole and worked at the wires that were tied around his wrist. I'm nothing but a hollow rabbit. Too late, thought Edward, as Bryce pulled the nails out of his ears. I'm only a doll made out of china. But when the last nail was out and he fell forward into Bryce's arms, the rabbit felt a rush of relief. And the feeling of relief was followed by one of joy. Perhaps, he thought, it is not too late, after all, for me to be saved. Also, it's in, he's got another opportunity. So the old woman had him as Clyde in the garden. And now we have Bryce taking him, rescuing him from that horrible scarecrow job. Now we're going to go to chapter 17. Look at that rickety little house. Bryce slung Edward over his shoulder. He started to walk. I come to get you for Sarah Ruth, Bryce said. You don't know Sarah Ruth. She's my sister. She's sick. She had her a baby doll made out of China. She loves that baby doll, but he broke it. He broke it. He was drunk and stepped on that baby's head and smashed it into a hundred million pieces. Them pieces was so small, I couldn't make them go back together. I couldn't. I, I tried and I tried. At this point in the story, Bryce stopped walking and shook his head and wiped at his nose with the back of his hand. Sarah Ruth ain't had nothing to play with since. He won't buy her nothing. He says she don't need nothing. He says she don't need nothing because she ain't gonna live. But he don't know. Bryce started to walk again. He don't know, he said. Who he was was not clear to Edward. What was clear was that he was being taken to a child to make up for the loss of a doll. A doll. How Edward loathed dolls. And to be thought of as a likely replacement for a doll offended him. But still, it was, he had to admit, a highly preferable alternative to hanging by his ears from a post. The house in which Bryce and Sarah Ruth lived was so small and crooked that Edward did not believe at first that it was a house. He mistook it instead for a chicken coop. Inside, there were two beds and a kerosene lamp and not much else. Bryce laid Edward at the foot of one of the beds and then lit the lamp. Sarah, Bryce whispered, Sarah Ruth, gotta wake up now, honey. I brought you something. He took the harmonica out of his pocket and played the beginning of a simple melody. <laughs> the little girl sat up in bed and immediately started to cough. <coughs> Bryce put his hand on her back. That's all right, he told her. That's okay. She was young, maybe four years old. She had white blonde hair. And even in the poor light of the lamp, Edward could see that her eyes were the same gold fleck brown as Bryce's. That's right, said Bryce. You go on ahead and cough. Sarah Ruth obliged him. She coughed and coughed and coughed. On the wall of the cabin, the kerosene light cast a trembling shadow, hunched over and small. <coughs> coughing was the saddest sound that Edward had ever heard. Sadder even than the mournful call of the whippoorwill. Finally, Sarah Ruth stopped. Bryce said, you want to see what I brung you? Sarah Ruth nodded. You got to close your eyes. The girl closed her eyes. Bryce picked up Edward and held him so that he was standing straight like a soldier at the end of the bed. All right now, you can open him. Sarah Ruth opened her eyes and Bryce moved Edward's china legs and china arms so it looked like he was dancing. Sarah Ruth laughed and clapped her hands. Rabbit, she said. He's for you, honey, Bryce said. Sarah Ruth looked first at Edward and then at Bryce and then back at Edward again, her eyes wide and disbelieving. Yep, he's yours. Mine? Sarah Ruth, Edward was soon to discover, rarely said more than one word at a time. Words, at least several of them strung together, would make her cough. So she limited herself. She said only what needed to be said. Yours, said Bryce. I got him special for you. This knowledge provoked another fit of coughing in Sarah Ruth. <coughs> <coughs> and she hunched over again. When the fit was done, she uncurled herself and held out her arms. That's right, said Bryce. 
and he handed Edward to her. Baby, said Sarah Ruth. She rocked Edward back and forth and stared down at him and smiled. Never in his life had Edward been cradled like a baby. Abilene had not done it, nor had Nellie, and most certainly Bull had not. It was a singular sensation to be held so gently and yet so fiercely, to be stared down at with so much love. Edward felt the whole of his china body flooded with warmth. You gonna give him a name, honey? Bryce asked. Jangles, said Sarah Ruth without taking her eyes off Edward. Jangles, huh? That's a good name. I like that name. Bryce patted Sarah Ruth on the head. She continued to stare down at Edward. Hush, she said to Edward as she rocked him back and forth. From the minute I first seen him, said Bryce, I knew he belonged to you. I said to myself, that rabbit is for Sarah Ruth for sure. Jangles, muttered Sarah Ruth. Here, it's a picture of Sarah Ruth and Holden now Jangles and then Bryce. He's young too, but he seems like he's kind of like her, her father figure. He seems so much older than what it looks like in the picture. He must be pretty young too. Outside the cabin, thunder cracked, and then came the sound of rain falling on the tin roof. Sarah Ruth rocked Edward back and forth, back and forth, and Bryce took out his harmonica and started to play, making his song keep with the rhythm of the rain. Okay, one more. Chapter... 18. Bryce and Sarah Ruth had a father. Early the next morning, when the light was gray and uncertain, Sarah Ruth was sitting up in bed, coughing. <coughs> and the father came home. He picked Edward up by one of his ears and said, I ain't never. It's a baby doll, said Bryce. Don't look like no baby doll to me. Edward, hanging by one ear, was frightened. This, he was certain, was the man who crushed the heads of China dolls. The man Bryce was talking about. Jangles, said Sarah Ruth <coughs> between coughs. And she held out her arms. He's hers, said Bryce. He belongs to her. Father dropped Edward on the bed and Bryce picked up the rabbit and handed him to Sarah Ruth. Don't matter anyway, said the father. Don't make no difference, none of it. It does so matter, said Bryce. Don't you sass me, said the father. He raised his hand and slapped Bryce across the mouth. And then he turned and left the house. You ain't got to worry about him, said Bryce to Edward. He ain't nothing but a bully. And besides, he don't hardly ever come home. Fortunately, the father did not come back that day. Bryce went out to work and Sarah Ruth spent the day in bed, holding Edward in her lap and playing with a box filled with buttons. Pretty, she said to Edward as she lined up the buttons on the bed and arranged them into different patterns. Sometimes, when a coughing fit was particularly bad, she squeezed Edward so tight that he was afraid he would crack in two. Also, in between coughing fits, she took to sucking on one or the other of Edward's ears. Normally, Edward would have found intrusive, clingy behavior of this sort very annoying. But there was something about Sarah Ruth. He wanted to take care of her. He wanted to protect her. He wanted to do more for her. At the end of the day, Bryce returned with a biscuit for Sarah Ruth and a ball of twine for Edward. Sarah Ruth held the biscuit in both hands and took small, tentative bites. You eat that all up, honey. Let me hold Jangles, said Bryce. Him and me got a surprise for you. Bryce took Edward off into the corner of a room, and with his pocket knife, he cut off lengths of twine and tied them to Edward's arms and feet, and then tied the twine to sticks of wood. See, all day I've been thinking about it, Bryce said. What are we going to do is make you dance. Sarah Ruth loves dancing. Mommy used to hold on to her and dance her around the room. Are you eating that biscuit? Bryce called out to Sarah Ruth. Uh-huh said Sarah Ruth. You hold on, honey. We got a surprise for you. Bryce stood up. Close your eyes, he told her. He took over Edward over to the bed and said, okay, you can open them up now. Sarah Ruth opened her eyes. Dance, Jangle, said Bryce. And then, moving the strings with the sticks with one hand, Bryce made Edward dance and drop and sway like a marionette. And the whole while, at the same time with his other hand, he held onto his harmonica and played a bright and lively tune. Sarah Ruth laughed. She laughed until she started to cough. And then Bryce laid Edward down and took Sarah Ruth in his lap and rock, rocked her and rubbed her back. You want some fresh air, he asked her. Let's get you out of this nasty old air, huh? Bryce carried his sister outside. He left Edward lying on the bed and the rabbit staring up at the smoke-stained ceiling, 
thought again about having wings. If he had them, he thought, he would fly high above the world to where the air was clear and sweet, and he would take Sarah Ruth with him. He would carry her in his arms, surely so high above the world she'd be able to breathe without coughing. After a minute, Bryce came back inside, still carrying Sarah Ruth. She wants you too, he said. Jingles, said Sarah Ruth, and she held out her arms. So Bryce held Sarah Ruth, and Sarah Ruth held Edward, and the three of them stood outside. Bryce said, you gotta look for falling stars. Them are the magic ones. They were quiet for a long time, all three of them looking up at the sky. Sarah Ruth stopped coughing. Edward thought that maybe she had fallen asleep. There, she said, and she pointed to a star shrieking through the night sky. Make a wish, honey, Bryce said, his voice high and tight. That's your star. You make a wish for anything you want. And even though it was Sarah Ruth's star, Edward wished on it too. So there we go. We've got our new, we got Jangles now. And that's the end of chapter 18. Okay, so leave a comment. Tell me what you think. Edward wanted to fly up with her and hold her and do more for her. It's amazing this transformation Edward is undergoing, huh? All right, till next time.